and uh, yeah, welcome also from my side. I hope that you can hear me well. Um, yeah, it, I have to say, when I was asked whether I would give a talk in this uh, program, uh, I felt honored in particular also when I list, looked at the list of other people giving talks. So that's quite impressive and it's quite an impressive audience which you provide. Um, before I start, uh, I'm, I'm from Germany. Right now I'm in California, the last day of the program uh, at, in, in, in Berkeley. And I'm sitting outside, it's eight in the morning and it was a bit difficult to get to the Institute because things start a bit later usually. Uh, on the other hand, uh, later, in the later in the day, it would have been difficult to make sure that I'm undisturbed. So, uh, again, it's a pleasure and honor to give this talk. And I want to talk about the dynamics, explain things about the dynamics of the quadratic family. And for that, I want to share my iPad. Sorry, that was wrong. So I, have, I hope that you can see that well. I have to say my age shows in the classes that I have to take them on and off in order to see things, but uh, that shouldn't be a problem. Um, so we, the, the basic question which we look at is, we look at a map, from some space, some set whatsoever to itself. And then we define recursively a sequence. We start with some point, evaluate the function and iterate that. That gives us a sequence. So this is setting which is highly relevant. So whenever we have a deterministic setting, where let's say the status on the next day is determined by the status on the previous day, which is true for some things, but not for others, uh, then we get such a sequence. And there is often a strong interest to understand what we might see. So situation which is not quite deterministic, but it was with COVID-19, uh, the number of infections, which at least according to some models, which one had to understand, had to understand the dynamics, uh, determines the situation at a later day later from the previous day or let's say in some time frame. Usually that's then a differential equation, but you are going to look about uh, what, what you can say about such maps, or such sequences. And the, I mean the, the basic question is, can one say something meaningful about the structure? Of course, one has to look at specific examples, but um, one would like to get some sort of understanding, um, even if one doesn't model the full, um, I mean, the, 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 the full problem. I think again of COVID-19, which is now a while ago, um, if one wants to understand the dynamics somehow, one has to simplify it a lot uh, in order to, uh, to get somewhere. So what we will do is we will do something which also historically, was the path to understanding uh, dynamics in a much more general setting. We look at a very specific example. I hope that you can see that well. We look at the map. There's one parameter mu, which is larger than zero. And we look at this map f mu on the interval zero one. Just a few things to um, get the setting. So we if mu is between zero and four, then it maps the interval to itself. If mu, if mu is larger than four, and if you evaluate it at the point one half, you get a value which is larger than one. In that case, we are interested in sequences which stay in that interval. So let's try to, let's start slowly and try to see how we can understand, approach this problem and how we can understand things. So, um, try to draw it. So we have the interval zero one. 
and we have a one half, we have a parabola which opens downwards. And I'm not sure so if I got this, but that should be the situation when we were small. So let me put one here. And I guess I didn't, I didn't do it very well. Uh, so let's say this is the diagonal. Which is which plays a certain role. So this is what we want to understand. I mean, what we see immediately see is that this value here is the value mu divided by four. This is something which is going to be important, stay important. And if you look at the derivative here, which I didn't draw very well, maybe I should put more things here. If you look at f, the derivative at zero, then look at this function, then this is equal to mu. So the slope is mu. Now, how can we try to see what, what happens, how the dynamics looks like? Well, let's see. If we start with some point, we want to put it here and just think that. Put a point x0 here. So then this is the value f of x0, initial point. And this is then the value which is x1. So how do you find x1 in this picture? Well, we go to the left until we hit the diagonal. And then we go down. So this is the value x1. Um, then from we look at f of x1, which is here, and we turn left, and we get x2. And what you can see in this scheme is that everything seems to converge to zero. How can we make that rigorous? How can we, can we understand that? Well, let me just see. Yeah. Um, so if you want to, to understand that, well, we can observe that um, f mu of x minus f mu of y, if you look at the difference and the absolute value of the difference, then this is bounded by the maximal slope. Now, the maximal slope, so we, we look at always at the interval, so we look at x, x, y in this interval. So in this interval, the slope um, is bounded by the slope at zero. It might be downward or upward, but it's bounded by the slope at zero. So this is less or equal to mu times the distance x minus y. So if mu is less than one, then this is called a contraction. This is called a contraction. Um, and there is a theorem, the Banach fixed point theorem. Um, let me put it here. I didn't make good use of the space. There's a Banach fixed point theorem, which says that in this case, there is a fixed point, there's a unique fixed point, but it's even easier than that. I mean, what we see is that the point zero is mapped to itself. And in particular, we see that f mu of x minus f mu of zero is less or equal to mu times x. So we wouldn't need absolute values here because we look at the interval zero one. And this has then the implication that xn plus one, if we iterate this map five uh, n times, let me not to take xn plus one, let me take xn. If we iterate that, then this is less or equal to, well, mu times x n minus one. So we get the next one by applying this map always less or equal and so on up to mu to the n times x zero. And again, I put absolute values, but I wouldn't need to do that. And this is less or equal to mu to the n. So if mu is less than one, then this converges to zero. And this is what we also see in this picture that in this case, the dynamics is quite simple. 
I should say, if you have questions, please ask questions probably in the chat and uh, then uh, but you're welcome to, to ask questions. Okay, so this is the easy situation. Now, what happens if we increase mu? Well, if we increase mu, then uh, we have this situation, let's say, it turns out that the right range to look at is then the interval mu between um, one and three. So what happens there? Well, let me try to draw a picture again. Well, we have the diagonal, we have one. And if mu is larger than one, then the slope at zero is larger than one. So, which means that the parabola is going to intersect the diagonal. Um, so here I put x, let's say if I put y here, then that is x equal to y. If we look at the parabola and then it has one half, that's the highest point. So we have a parabola, which looks maybe like that. Uh, I think I didn't do a good drawing. Run into prop. I run into problems later on if I keep that. So. Let's see, we have this situation. Then obviously we have that f mu of zero is equal to zero. So this remains a fixed point. If we, if we intersect the diagonal at some point here, um, let's say x bar, then we also know that f mu of x bar is equal to x bar, right? So these are two fixed points. Now what happens if we try to understand the dynamics, well, we do what we did before. We start with some point, x0, go up to the graph, turn left until we hit the diagonal. This is then x1. Then we go up. Okay, and then I, I wanted to have a picture like that. So let me, so you, you run into a situation where you circle around the fixed point and uh, everything converges to the fixed point. Why does it converge to the fixed point? Well, um, so the important issue here is, if you look at this fixed point x bar, if you look at x bar, and you do, a, which you can calculate, and I'm going to give a formula later on, if you look at the derivative x bar, then the absolute value of that is less than one. Um, okay, so the derivative is less, the absolute value of the derivative is less than one. What does this imply? Well, by the same argument as before, uh, it implies that um, then points converge to this point. It implies that one gets a contraction, but possibly only near this point x bar, because now the, um, the derivative x at, at this point um, is less than one, but at other points it might be larger than one. If we look at the left, then what we see is that the dynamics is somehow like this. So we have x bar, we have zero, one. So here we see that things move to the right. Here, if you look at that, then from here we jump to the left. And um, here we are jumping around and, also, and getting to this point. Now, before I continue, um, I want to ask what happens at the change? What, what is the change at mu is equal to one? Um, now, if I draw a picture here, Just 
if, if you look at what we have here, then at mu equal to one, we have the diagonal and our parabola is tangential to the, to the um, diagonal. So if we enlarge, so if you are below, if you are below, then the derivative here is, so this is some parabola where, where mu is smaller, then here we hit it like this. And if we are larger, then we first go up and then we go down. And of course, if we do it slowly, then we get a fixed point, which is moving then um, to the right slowly. So the, the way to make that, to understand that, or the different ways to rigorously understand that, um, if one want, wants to prove this, then there are different possibilities. The first possibility is to say, well, we look at quadratic equations and we simply solve. So we look for this fixed point. We want to see, see that there's a second, second fixed point which is occurring. So we could look at the quadratic equation and we could simply solve. The second possibility would be, well, we do analysis. I have to say my background is analysis. And what we do is something which is called uh, some bifurcation, bifurcation analysis. And this boils down then here to an application of the implicit function theorem, which you may or may not know, uh, but that's a typical application then, uh, uh, sort of the sophisticated application of the, the by uh, implicit function theorem. But it, what you can see quite visibly is what happens if the um, if the graph is tangent to the diagonal at the point where it intersects the diagonal, uh, there something has to change depending on the size of the derivative. Okay, so this is the easy part. Now here's the fixed point, or I guess I would have had more space to have my sheets. Uh, mixed up, so that's the calculation of the fixed point. And then you can uh, look at, at this, I mean, they can ca calculate this fixed point, look at this derivative. And then uh, what you see is that if you look at the derivative of f mu at this point, mu, then this tends to minus one as mu tends to three from above. So we discussed that change happens if the derivative um, is one. So what is if the derivative is, tends to minus one? Well, in that case, we could look at f mu composed with f mu, um, take the derivative um, mu minus one divided by mu, and this then, I mean, it's a, it's a chain rule. This converges to one. Um, well, this converges to one, and uh, it does so from below if mu tends to three from below, and from above if mu tends to three from above. So, what we have here is we have a similar situation. So, the situation at zero repeats. It's a repetition. Of the behavior near zero at mu equal to one. But now for the composition for write this f mu composed with f mu as f mu squared. So this is the definition that's not the square, but it's the iterated uh, map. Okay. So this tells us that there's a transition at this point three and something new is happening. Now, 
we could continue with that. And then I guess it would be harder and harder. So let, let us ask the question, is, is there something we can do to gain insights, maybe without doing rigorous calculations? Is there something we can do, sim do simply to see, um, to get an idea of the behavior? Well, there's the following we might do. That's now a numerical experiment. And I have to say that uh, numerical experiments played an important role in the development of the subject. I'm going to come to that in more detail. Um, originally, with, well, with something that you don't know, I guess, with a simple calculator, which was sort of, sort of handheld calculator where you typed in formulas and cal did calculations, additions, and multiplications. Um, and that was the, the starting point. Now, what, what we do is more sophisticated. Um, what did I want to say here? Okay, let me let me simply. How do, how do we? So this this was the part. Then what happens at the point three? Uh, this I explained, um, but I don't want to write anything also because uh, of arranging the time. Um, what you then see is to explain this that you get the same similar situation which we had at mu equal to one at the point zero, but for the iterated, the iterated map. So this means that you get an additional fixed point, but now for the iterated map, which means that you get a periodic orbit of period two, so which comes forth and back. Um, and this is a bit harder to see. So let's, let's simply try to, uh, to, to check it. What we do is we start, we take some value of mu. We start with some point, which hopefully doesn't matter. So let's call it a random start point. And then we do 1000 iterations and plot the next 100. So we start with x0, x1, and so on. We iterate the map. We apply f mu to x1 to get x2, to get f mu to get to x2 to get x3 until we buy, uh, add x100. And then we do that, we repeat that 100 times and remember the points and plot them. So if mu is equal to two, well, we have seen that in that case, we have zero as a fixed point, but things go away from zero. So if we don't start at zero, we are not get, going to get to zero. And what we see in this experiment is that there is a unique fixed point. So after 1000 iterations, uh, it's only one point which, which we see. At mu equal to three, the picture is slightly wrong. So they are still, uh, so they, what you see here is we know that we should have one fixed point, but what we see is that there are two points. So they're not yet, uh, not, not, not yet at this point because this convergence is pretty slow. But then if we enlarge it, then they move apart and this is, the dynamics is that this zero sits simply, and from here we go to here, and we go to here, and um, if we start somewhere else at a, at, a, at a random point, then we get a sequence that which starts here, 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 and so on, gets closer and closer to this two periodic orbit. So this remains true for larger values of mu and here. So now what we observe is there is some sort of stability of the picture. The stability of the picture, so if you change mu a bit, then the dynamic still looks the same, but there are some points where there is a change, namely at mu equal to three, where we get from a fixed point to something to a two periodic point, or at mu equal to one, where we got from one fixed point to two fixed points, namely zero and the point which we see above here. And there is some sort, some issue of stability. So if we are here in this case, mu equal to two, then what happens is that everything moves away from zero. So this is unstable and everything moves to this fixed point. So this is stable. And I mean, from the experiment, 
we only see things which are stable because we choose a random point um, and we only see things which are stable. And there are two different notions of stability here, which I, which I don't want to formalize. One is that um, what we see is roughly independent of the starting point. Um, and that the other one is that there's a smooth or continuous change uh, if we change mu of the, of the picture. I don't want to make that precise because that is more sophisticated, but I think in this example, it's quite, quite visible. So, how do we continue? Well, we could continue with these pictures and I want to show what we get. So if we enlarge mu, well, what we get is we get four points. And from what I discussed, what we discussed is what we expect is that, we, that there's a periodic point uh, of period field, uh, four, so a sequence where we get, let's say, from x0, we start in this, to x1, to x2, to x3, and then back to x0. So let's say this, call this point x0, I think it's this one. Well, uh, so it's, it's short, so this one that always happens. So if you enlarge it even further, then you get a complicated picture. And well, mu equal to four is a sort of limit point. Uh, but if you enlarge it, we get more complicated picture, which is difficult, maybe somewhat difficult to understand. So we can continue with that. And um, at mu equal to four, it you might expect that there was some uh, severe change, but it's less and less clear what's going on. Um, maybe one comment, we again, we see only stable things because we choose a random initial data. I, I should have chosen several initial points to demonstrate that, but I hope that you believe me that the picture doesn't change uh, if you choose different uh, points unless we hit very specific points. So how should we, what should you make of that? There is a very simple idea. And that is to put everything into a two-dimensional picture. So what you have seen is there's a period doubling from two to one to two to four and so on. The question is, what are, does it happen? And we put everything into one picture. And this one I took from, uh, I didn't produce myself. The other ones I produced myself. Uh, I took it from the internet from Walter Bislin. It's public domain. And it goes back to Feigenbaum. So let me explain, explain this picture. So on this side, we have mu, we have to turn things around. Here we have x. So here we are in the range between, we start at 2.4. The interesting thing happens then before that. So what we have here is a stable fixed point. So a point which is mapped to itself and where neighboring orbits are mapped to it. So, and the picture is produced in exactly the same way as what I produced above. Then we continue. And at C, we see that there are, we get two points, as we have seen in this, the previous pictures. And that's a two periodic point. So they jump from one to another. And then the picture here is, now I'm not entirely sure how it looks like, but I think it's you go from here to here, then you go here, here, and then back here. Paste that because then it looks nicer. Okay, and what we then see here is if enlarge it, the limit to which I can do it is that this picture repeats. So there's some self-similarity and this looks the same as the whole picture. And then we can increase and it gets more complicated and it will come back to that a bit later. So this is, um, it goes back to Feigenbaum, um, physicist from 44, 1944, he lived from 1944 to 2019. He got his PhD in physics at MIT in 1970. 
and uh, the prestigious Wolf, Wolf Prize in 1986, and uh, he's famous for this work. There is a so-called Feigenbaum constant. So what you can do in this picture is you can look at the interval You can look at this interval and compare it in size to the next interval. And you continue and so on, and you can, can look at the quotient. And if you look at this quotient, then this, this converges with higher and higher periods to a constant, which is which you can find in the internet to more digits than what I gave. Now, what is the interest in showing you this number? Well, the interest is it's it's possible to define to calculate this number to have a very high accuracy, which means that it is somewhat universal. So there's some universal feature in that, and it's quite impressive. Um, and it plays plays an important role. So. This picture somehow the self similarity and that this constant exists shows that this behavior, which we have seen now partly for this very specific example, has very universal features. Uh, Herr Bert, there's a question from the audience uh, from Shi Han, uh, who is wondering what the white stripe in the picture signifies. Or the <laughs> white stripes. Uh, well, there the, are the two, two answers. Um, first, I, I explained to you how the picture is made. So you start somewhere, you iterate, maybe not 1,000 times, but 100,000 times, I don't know. And then you plot the next 200, 500 values. So what you see, what, what, what the, the picture here is exactly that. I mean, there is some sort of numerical dirt because you start at some point, the calculation is not entirely accurate, but the behavior is sort of universal. So the good reasons to believe that the computer, the calculations at the computer don't, uh, I mean, that they, they, they're reliable. So this is simply the numerical experiment. So that is what it is. Now I explained, I told you that we see only stable things. So, we, so what, what this indicates is that if you look at the sequences, then in this white spot that there are very few points, if any. It's a good question to ask and to try to understand why this happens. But at this point, it's simply this numerical experiment. Simply we do some, we do a simple, uh, simple numerical experiment and plot what we see and try to understand that. And part of the understanding is that we only see stable phenomena. And I'll come back to that picture. Um, at one point, it's, I mean, it's quite intriguing. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, there was a suggestion to have a break. Maybe after half an hour, it's time for a break of five minutes. Is that okay? Yes, of course. Uh, so, um, uh, so I would ask the students then to post any questions they might have into the chat. Uh, on the talk so far, and um, so everyone can catch up. And uh, uh, I leave it to you, uh, the floor to you, Herbert. Uh, what what we do with your break, with this break? Can either ah. answer, answer, start to answer questions on the uh, that are uh, posted into the chat, uh, so students can follow along better. Or okay, can, yeah, sure. Or you can tell an anecdote, or you can show us the view uh, uh, that you have uh, in Berkeley over the bay. Anything <laughs> you choose. Okay, then I will suggest first I'll show you the view, which I guess is not what you will expect. <laughs> uh, but you have to stop sharing your screen. Um, uh, sorry, yeah. Um, So there's a lot of fog. 
Oh, that is exactly what I would expect of San Francisco. So what would we uh, what would we see if there weren't so much fog, Herbert? Well, from this from this view, um, at this point, I guess we wouldn't see so much. But if I would turn things to the right, we would see the Golden Gate Bridge, the mm -hmm. bay and the Golden Gate Bridge, which is quite spectacular. If below the campus of UC Berkeley. Uh, so I take it you are already at MSRI. Or oh, is it a workshop at MSRI? Yes, it's a workshop at MSRI. I am already at MSRI. Uh, and I decided to do it from, from MSRI because the hotel is not, I mean, it's not, not such a great place for a Zoom meeting. So maybe we should explain to the students that, uh, so yesterday we, we met the mathematician, Martin Heira, and he's really rich <laughs> through doing mathematics. So he there's one thing, he has the MMDS uh, software, which I think was uh, very successful, but he also won the breakthrough prize with $3 million. Um, uh, dollars. But it's very um, unusual for a mathematician. Mathematicians are usually well off, but you know not all of us are rich. Uh, but, and here I'm quoting a mathematician I'm very fond of, Percy Diaconis, who is also a fun person. You can check out, uh, I'm posting his name uh, to the chat. Uh, he said, well, we may not be rich, but we travel a lot <laughs> and very well. And one of the really nice places that mathematicians travel to um, is uh, Berkeley, is uh, the Mathematics Research Institute there. And uh, it is a fantastic view and uh, really nice working conditions. And uh, mathematicians spend uh, several weeks there sometimes, uh, sometimes only one week for workshops. Uh, and uh, you know, lots of lots of mathematicians come together uh, and discuss and argue, <laughs> and uh, and usually have a very good time. What's your uh, Herbert? What what is your favorite? Um, uh, venue for a conference or a workshop. Is it MSRI or are there other places you really like and enjoy going to for math? Um, well, I guess MS MSRI and Berkeley is uh, always somewhat spectacular for me because it's further away and uh, I uh, really like the area. So not I mean for mathematics, but not only for mathematics. Uh, I uh, uh, several many nice places. There is Oberwolfach in, Oberwolfach in Germany, which has a sort of different style with week-long conferences. Um, so students, check these places out. Oberwolfach is a really famous uh, mathematics research institute. Uh, it was very important for the development of uh, uh, mathematics after World War II uh, in Central Europe. Uh, there's always Schwarzwälder Kirschtorte, so it's a special cake that they prepare in south southwest Germany. And uh, so Oberwolfach, their strategy is to lock mathematicians away for a week. So it's in the middle of the Schwarz, Schwarzwald, uh, a, a huge forest in southwestern Germany. And uh, it's in the middle of nowhere. Uh, it's it's very pretty, very nice, but there's really nothing else that you can do except for uh, doing mathematics uh, and having Schwarzwälder Kirschtorte. That's pretty much it. They don't even give you internet uh, in the rooms. You have to come out and <laughs> talk to other people oh. if you want to check your emails. I, I think this changed. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so glad you are saying that. <laughs> yeah. There are more nice places. So, I mean, if you talk with mathematicians, then I guess there are several names which always come up. Uh, some depend a bit on the background. Uh, certainly, Sirm in Mar at Marseille is it's, it's also a spectacular environment and a very nice place and has very pleasant memories of that. Herbert, would you say uh, hello uh, from me to Tatiana Toro? She's uh, the director of MSRI mm -hmm. and she's my academic aunt. Ah, okay. So she's, um, um, right. So it's another I, thing you must understand. Mathematicians usually keep very careful track 
whose prodigies they are, who uh, their advisors were. And my advisor's advisor is another student, actually many other students, and her name is Tatiana Toro, and she's an outstanding mathematician, and she's currently the director of NSRI. I'm not sure whether I'm going to meet her. It's my last day at MSI. But if I meet her, I will do that. I guess I will have some email contact with her anyhow. There's maybe a funny story. So I have a joint paper with Tatiana Toro, which we wrote uh, before I met her for the first time. Oh. I mean, there were four authors. <laughs> so. so, and it was before the pandemic? It was long it was before a, the pandemic. Long yeah. before the pandemic. So how did you how did you start that collaboration if you hadn't even met? Um oh, I had been when was that? I, I think it was still during my postdoc times when I visited uh, Brown University. Mm -hmm. I didn't visit Chil Pfeiffer, but I talked with Chil Pfeiffer and uh, then that started then this cooperation, which included Tatiana Toro and Carlos Kennick. Was that, a, may I ask, Herbert, was that before uh, uh, mathematicians started to use emails to share ideas? Was that when mathematicians were still oh. writing letters to one another? Oh, um, the time when mathematicians wrote letters was mostly before my Scientific. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, in my defense, I know mathematicians younger than you, <laughs> or let me say, less senior than you, who are still writing, who are still writing letters, or at least yeah. until recently. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Ingrid Dobeshi, for example. Oh, yeah. It's okay. a very nice correspondence. Ingrid Dobeshi is a famous Belgian mathematician. Technically, she's a physicist, but mathematicians like to, you know, claim her. Uh, so she came up uh, with, uh, um, you know, uh, in collaboration with colleagues, but she, she was one of the most, uh, most important contributors with what is called wavelets. And um, so uh, wavelets, you know, every modern piece of technology that you use uh, applies wavelets uh, in some one way or another. And uh, uh, recently, uh, uh, another mathematician who contributed to this theory uh, had a pivotal role in its development, Yves Meyer. He was awarded the Abel Prize. So I haven't you know, introduced you to an Abel Prize winner yet in this lecture series, but you know, that's the award, uh, very that's a very, very senior award in mathematics. You know, maybe there is even a minimum age, but you you have to be quite old. And uh, uh, on that occasion, actually, MSRI published uh, a correspondence uh, between uh, Ingrid Dobeshi and and other uh, colleagues of hers uh, on the development of um, uh, of wavelet theory. So it's it's a really fun read. Okay, so. I think uh, we can check uh, check off the anecdotes, Herbert. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Let's resume with math. But okay. it's good for your education students. <laughs> okay. Let's let's resume. Um, before I go to the uh, to the iPad, um, one one thing, it's difficult for me to follow the chat. I. I'm glad, Michael, that you will answer questions, but uh, Michael, please interrupt me if, uh, as you also did, uh, if, if there's something I can, should answer. Okay, so let's... Share, let's continue here. So we're back at this picture and um, well, let me get back to Mitchell Feigenbaum. Um, so he got his PhD in 1970 and I guess I don't have, unfortunately I don't have the full 
uh, time frame here, he proved this universality so that this which is connected to that this period doubling, this, which explains this the quotient of um, periods, previous periods, uh, the next period, uh, the interval in, on the mu space, that this converges, and that this is well defined. Um, that's part of un uh, this universality that he proved in 1978. And um, he had the insight and the number from calculations on a handheld calculator um, four years before that. And there were other people who did that. Uh, but what I want to say is that what he did basically, at least my understanding, he produced a picture like the one which you see here and wondered what he was seeing like you did when you asked for the white, the meaning of the white spots. Now, let's let's go back so and let's try to think of what we want to see we want to understand we want to understand the dynamics we want to understand what we get if you start from a point apply the map f mu and so on so we have a situation when the outcome is determined by the input and we iterate that if you get if you look at fixed points these are points where um, where f mu of x is equal to x. Then we get a sequence which is constant. And this is not so interesting. We know what the constants are because we have to look at the, uh, well, let's see the or pictures. So we, we have the diagonal, we have the parabola, we look at the intersections. The intersections are fixed points. It's a parabola, an intersection of parabola with a line uh, has zero, one, or two fixed points. Um, it always has uh, intersections, it always has at least one intersection in our setting because zero is one point of the intersection. If mu is less than one, then that's exactly it. If mu is larger than one, then there are two intersections two points of intersection because of the setting there are uh, the second point is between zero and one and we can calculate it and that is what you see from this picture now if you look at periodic points two periodic points then there are fixed points of the iterate this f mu square which is f mu composed with f mu so this is what i've drawn here and this is for, for mu equal to three. And we see what we discussed. So at mu equal to three, we see that the graph that there's this fixed point and the graph is tangent. Below that, this intersection uh, is one says transversal because the derivative then is smaller than one. At mu equal to three, the, in the, the ten, tangent becomes, the graph becomes tangent. And if mu is larger, then this goes let's say if we enlarge mu, then the picture would be something like that, so that we get two, um, that we get um, two, another two periodic um, point, but now for the second iterate, which means that we get period four. So then if we take the, so this is then the third picture, if we take that, we see that there is this fixed point again, which is the same as in all the picture because it stays. But what we see is that there's exactly one fixed point. Well, there are two, I mean, zero and, and this one, and then that's it. So, which means that there's no orbit, there's no sequence of period three, uh, of minimal period three in this picture. So we have this, uh, the fixed points, and, and that's it. Which are the fixed points which we had here, so that's not the minimal period. Well, and then we can iterate that, and we get the fourth, which is then again uh, tangent here. Okay, let's do that for some larger value which I forgot. So this is some larger value. We start again with 
this situation, we see that we have two fixed points, which we know anyhow. Um, then we see what, what, what happened. So we have this, this again, the fixed points here. And now what we have here is a two periodic orbit. So this, this one is mapped to that. Uh, so, I mean, it's the second iterate, which means that on this map, this, so if I, if I look at this point and put it here, then this value is the value here. And uh, then this goes back and forth. Again, if you take the third one, if you take the third one, oh. you take the third one, then there's exactly one. So there is no same as the picture with one. So there is no uh, sequence of period three. And then if you take four, five, six, then the picture gets compli more complicated. But um, when we look at it for five, is, it's in clear that there's only two fixed points and um, there's no orbit of the period five. Well, there is a famous theorem um, that's Tchaikovsky's theorem. And before I explain it, um, Alexander, you can pronounce it much better than I do, Tchaikovsky is an Ukrainian mathematician um, who lived from 1936 until 2022. Uh, I think he did, died in November 2000, 20, 2000, 2022, um, which was, yeah, was a bad time. It's a bad time. And he proved his theorem in 1964. So what does this theorem say? Well, this theorem, I mean, Tchaikovsky um, did, I mean, he did important work on the understanding of chaos. I avoided the word, word chaos up to now. Um, and what he does is, I mean, is, is connected to, to chaos. And I think this theorem is the is most famous theorem. Let me try to explain what it is. So. In, I call a sequence an orbit, this map, and I didn't formally define what a period is. I talk about the minimal period. I hope that it's clear what, what that is. And he looked at, um, in, in a somewhat general context, one-dimensional maps, an interval. Um, he looked at the connection between periods of uh, orbits of different periods. And what he proved is, that if there is an orbit of period three, then there are orbits, there are sequences, sequences of all other periods. It was much more precise than that. So he said, well, if there, if there is an orbit of period two, then this implies that there's also a fixed point and a setting which, is, which covers the maps we have seen. If there's an orbit of period four, then there's an orbit of period two. And we can see that in the pictures. Well, and this goes on with other powers. I didn't write it completely. If there's an orbit of period two to the K times two N plus one, so that's an odd number, then there are orbits of all powers of, this field of all powers of two. And if there's an orbit, of the odd length two n plus one, then there's are also orbits of all uh, powers of two multiplied by two n plus one. And this goes then down. So the, if if there's an orbit of uh, period three, then there's are orbits of period two to the k times three and so on. So this says that, I mean, the maybe rough understanding is of the interpretation of that is that period three implies chaos uh, because then there are um, uh, there are sequences, there are complicated sequences. Now let's go back to this picture and let's wonder what you see. You asked about the white spots. So what you can see in this white spots is, I mean, there's 
in particular this white spot here. What you can see here is that this line is quite visible. So what this indicates is the stable orbit of period three. So this is stable with period three. So with the theorem of Tchaikovsky, you know that there are all other periods, but they're unstable, so you don't see them. What you also seem to see here is that this picture, that's a self-similar version of the whole picture, so it repeats itself. And uh, this is one thing, I guess, which made then Feigenbaum's proof of universality possible. So I, I don't go into the mass of that. Um, I think if I would spend maybe, um, well, two or three lessons on the theorem, I could possibly probably prove it um, for an audience like you. So it's, it's a nice theorem. It, the proof is quite elementary and accessible with elementary means, um, but it's not really doable in the time which I, which I still have. Now, what happens if mu is larger than four? So if mu is larger than four, then oh, I think I should, I wanted to have more things here. So then if mu is larger than four, then the parabola extends above the value one. So there are points here, which are mapped to the left. So if it go so here, that is mapped to the left and then it vanishes. So if we want to understand that, then, well, um, uh, I mean, what could we understand? I want to look at orbits which stay in the interval zero one. So I only look at, at this part. Now, if we iterate it, then let's say there are points here. So let's say this point here gets mapped to that one the one half, and then it goes off to um, minus infinity. So if we look at the second iterate here and intersect it with the this, this, this hate one, then we get this picture and then we get four. Okay, what you can see here is that this uh, situation leads to a setting where the structure may be not quite easy to describe. We will look at that, but um, it's a setting which seems to be fairly robust um, and understandable. And in the end it is, and it's also quite quite interesting. And I want to tell you what, what it is. And that's the last thing I think which I want to tell. I don't want to prove it. I guess I don't, I mean, what about it? Or pictures which are basically proofs. Um, so let's see. We have this thing. And we want to draw the points. Oh. So we have these points and what we see is this part here goes off to minus infinity in the, in the end. So if you want to look at sequences which stay in this interval, then we have to give up this. Now, well, so let's say we have this point, we go down the diagonal, we go here, go down the diagonal, we get to this point. So then we go here. So what happens is this part here, we start here, we go here, we start here, we go here, and then we go off to infinity. Now, if you repeat that, then there is going to be 
some part here, which goes, uh, where does it go? I guess I, so if, if, if you start here, then it goes to this. If you start here, then it goes to, I got that wrong, um, then it goes to this side and so on. So I, I think I have to draw the part of the picture in a slightly different fashion. So we have the interval zero one, we have points here, we take this out, then we take this one, take this out, this part out, Do you see what happens? So we get something like a contour set. So the contour set is if you take the, um, the, the contour set is if you take this interval from the zero, from zero to one, then you take out the middle part from two third to three third, as from one third to two thirds. Then you take out the middle part of the remaining intervals and you keep going and you get, uh, well, I mean, then if you do that here, then you look at the intersection of all these things, then you get all the starting points for sequences which stay in the interval zero one. So that may be a theorem. The sequences which stay in the interval zero one and one to one correspondence to sequences with values zero and one. And the map F mu corresponds to the shift map. Now, the, the, the map is, is quite easy to define. So we, we look at this orbit. We have again the interval zero one. And then we start somewhere, we, we take the initial data, which stays in this interval. So maybe it starts here. And where does it go? Well, here we have one half. So one half is not in the set because that goes to minus infinity. So this is then mapped, let's say x0, if it stays in it, it's mapped either to a point, let's say x1 on this side, or then it might go from here to some x2 and so on. But what we know is that either the point lies in the interval between zero and one half or one half and one lies in the interval zero, one half. We give the, the sequence, this map. So I mean, what, what we do is we map, we map x zero to the sequence xn and we map this to the sequence yn yn, where this here is, we simply say that yn is equal to zero if xn is less than one half and one if xn is larger than one half. And if you look at this map, then one can show that this, that, that's, that there's a one-to-one -one correspondence of the sequences, that's not, not so hard to see, but I don't want to, um, to really go into that. Um, there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between the sequences which stay in the interval zero and one, um, and the sequences with, which only takes values zero and one. And well, we can also see what the map does. So if, if we, we have this, the, the, the map from, x zero to um, f mu of x zero corresponds to the map which maps the sequence y n and larger than zero to the sequence which is just shifted by one or n larger than zero and that is quite quite obvious. Um, well there is more than um, one, one could do here. So maybe let me bring in the words as a Cantor set, we get a, get a Cantor set. And 
um, what you can see from this, if you, if you know that, that it's a very large set, in some sense, it's not countable, not a countable set, because the sequences are not countable, um, if you know what that is. So they're in some sense quite big. Um, and this, I mean, this, this map here, this, this uh, identification with the zero one maps is something which allows to understand the dynamics. It implies, for example, that in this range, you have periodic orbits of all periods, but not only periodic orbits. So what you have is we have, so, have all sorts of, all sort of orbits. Describe some sequence with values in zero and one, and then there's an orbit which realizes that if you decide and look at that, that it goes to the left or to the right. Good. Let me just stop. Oh, there's a LaTeX problem here uh, with keywords. So we had fixed points and periodic points, um, stability, which means that. We have the same behavior if we slightly change the starting point. Structural stability, which I uh, didn't name this fashion. It is, we have changes which are continuously with mu. Um, then the big theorems, well, oh, sorry for the misspelling, Tchaikovsky's theorem, that period three implies existence of all periods, which are then unstable seen that we don't see them in the Feigenbaum diagram. And the Feigenbaum diagram is universal, so that gives some sort of universal understanding of at least some maps, some uh, dynamics, even in a much more, uh, in much more complicated settings. And that's the end of my talk. Um, I didn't uh, look at the chat. <laughs> uh, don't worry. <laughs> It's uh, um, it's all good. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Herbert, for this beautiful lecture. Um, so now we come to the freestyle uh, portion of uh, uh, our program. Uh, students, uh, please please go ahead. Don't be shy. Uh, ask any questions that you might have. Uh, they may be related um, to to Herbert's talk. Uh, Herbert is professor at the University of Bonn, uh, so that's one of the great European centers of mathematics. Um, it's uh, uh, a, a really terrific place to do your undergraduate studies or maybe uh, a semester abroad. Uh, go ahead and ask questions. Don't be shy. Anyone? <laughs> Yeah, please go ahead. Yes, thank you. Uh, I was wondering if we could take this picture that you are showing us here and somehow expand it to the left uh, for values of mu before or well, less than 2.4. Uh, sorry, I've di difficulties to understand you. Could you speak up? Um, okay, so can you? Show this picture that you were, you were showing before. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if we could uh, somehow expand it to the left. Yeah. And will we see something interesting uh, for values of new before or less than two periods for? Mm -hmm. So what happens when, uh, so this diagram uh, yeah, is only showing uh, the behavior for values where mu is greater than 2.4. So to mm -hmm. the left of 2.4, um, um, ah. the behavior is different. Uh, and maybe, maybe not even that exciting. But can you remind us again what happens there? Okay. Uh, so now I try to I, I draw the. Yeah. So 
we have mu equal to zero. Um, then we have one and we have three. And the diagram would be, let's say here we have, so this part is quite boring as you will see. So we have then this value here, which is slightly above 0 0.6. And um, I think a bit, yeah. So that would be the full, the full diagram. And let me, I come back to that. So that you can see here in these pictures, um, at mu equal to two, we start with a point, and then if I would continue it, it would be like this. So now I turn this picture around. Does it, this answer the question? Yeah, certainly. So uh, that's something that you can verify that the behavior is actually not so rich uh, when mu is less than uh, two point four. Yeah, it's a it's a good exercise. So it's getting really hard only when you are going to the uh, to the right. I mean, if you want to verify that, what you have to look at is you have to look at the equation mu x times one minus x is equal to x. And then look at the derivatives. So you have to look at the fixed points and uh, you have, have to look at the contraction. That's a good exercise. Hmm. Uh, any other questions? Maybe maybe I, I can ask a question, Herbert. Um, so you are uh, a world leading expert on uh, the theory of uh, the mathematical theory of fluid motion, the Stavia, uh, Navia Stokes equations. So uh, I, I have this, I'm not an expert in this field, but I have this idea that uh, notions of chaos and uh, chaotic behavior and dynamic behavior also play a really important role uh, in that area. Can you? Can you tell us a little bit about your research and how it may or may not uh, um, have uh, chaotic um, behavior? <laughs> the chaos matters in your day-to-day -day work as a mathematician. Uh, okay, maybe I don't, I'm not going to try to answer the, I mean, for, for me, there are several questions in several directions in which I could answer uh, your, your, your question. You get so, to your favorite direction. <laughs> okay, then uh, let me talk about the fluid dynamics and chaos and uh, not look at what I actually do. Uh, because I have to admit that most of what I did, uh, and certainly what I did in fluid dynamics is, well, Maybe there's some some link to chaotic behavior, but it's not a really strong one. And one of the reasons is that um, the questions. I mean, there's a lot of chaos plays an important role in fluid dynamics, um, as you can see if you look at uh, weather forecast or turbulent flows. Well, not don't want to define that. Um, so it, it plays an important role and there are, I mean, there are famous mathematical problems. There's the Millennium problem, which asks for the well-posedness of the Navier-Stokes equations in three dimensions. Uh, certainly uh, worked on well-posedness of these equations. And there's the highly relevant situation when the viscosity, the, the friction is very small. Um, for example, if you look at large scales of flows, uh, I've seen that. Programs, there were programs, there were, it wasn't a program, but there, there are some papers, some discussions uh, about uh, the 
atmosphere of planets, what we see there, uh, there is some sort of chaotic behavior and also some regularity. The chaos in fluid dynamics comes, it's more from the physical side and maybe also the motivation of people like Feigenbaum. Um, chaos is the situation when you expect that um, you get an energy transfer to very small scales. It's important to look at where the energy is, try to localize it, try to localize the scales. Uh, chaos is, the turbulence is, if you get energies transmitted to very small scales, um, and that is very difficult to, um, very, very difficult to, um, to understand. But there has been a lot of progress in a direction which I'm not quite sure whether that gives directly a much better understanding. Uh, there has been a construction of weak solutions, so-called so weak solutions um, in recent years to the fluid dynamics without viscosity, without friction, um, which are very different from everything which has been classically done. Uh, it's not clear whether they appear in this form in nature, uh, but they give sort of understanding of how energy could be transmitted to small scales. So maybe that was too technical. Um, but the, what I maybe what I want to say is that uh, really understanding turbulence and chaos for fluid dynamics is extremely hard, and I'm not sure whether we are going to see a solid understanding of that. Um, within the next decades, but it's a, an area which motivates a lot of research and a lot of uh, yeah, gives a lot of intriguing questions. So Maybe there are lots of cool videos uh, online on chaos turbulence and the Navier Stokes equations, but uh, uh, I've checked checked a few of them while you were explaining, and it seems mostly they are made by physicists. Sure, sure. We mathematicians are not so good in producing pictures. Oh. And uh, I have to say, preparing this talk and wanting, I mean, I wanted to present pictures, uh, took took more energy and time than a standard talk, another talk would take. <laughs> but it was a good experience. I think it was very uh, beautifully done. Uh, Thank you. Yeah, Beth, can you, can you tell us a little bit about lecturing styles? So, uh, uh, I mean, this is a, a, an online presentation, and I must um, uh, confess, when I was a, a student and, and a graduate student, PhD, uh, and um, um, there, were, th there was no such thing as online lectures. In fact, I remember, so I got my PhD um, uh, at Stanford University, uh, maybe uh, 40, 50 kilometers south of uh, San Francisco, and uh, I remember uh, uh, in our geometry and analysis seminar, uh, the very, very rare occasions where somebody gave a Beamer presentation. In fact, I think it was overheads that we used at the time. I don't know if, if students know what an overhead projector is. It's, uh, you know, they're being phased <laughs> out. And it was scandalous. You know, my advisor and his advisor, we did not want, they did not want to see slides. They wanted to see <laughs> they wanted the lecturers to suffer at the board, blood, sweat, and tears, <laughs> and show their <laughs> And uh, I must say, there's still a little bit of me uh, in that. What do you think, Herbert? Uh, in your in your line of work, there are these huge estimates. They go over pages. Uh, I mean, one would think it's it's you know people are relieved that finally. There are other ways of, of uh, sharing these estimates in, in, in talks. Uh, how do you feel about it? Or do you, do you prefer good old uh, Blackboard style talks? Well, for, for most things, I, I prefer, I have to say, I prefer Blackboard. I mean, the other presentations gives, have some opportunities, mm -hmm. so, and that's good if they are used. Uh, but for lecturing in class, I only use, basically only use the blackboard. Mm -hmm. And also for research talks, I, of course, um, give more talks with 
with a projector than than on the blackboard um, and some i guess some sort of mix um, use of both things is, is quite good uh, but but i have tendency more for blackboard <laughs> and something personal <laughs> um I moved, I got a position as professor in Dortmund in 2000. And then I joined an online video seminar with Berkeley Paris at that time, mm -hmm. Magic Swarovski, Jean-Marc Delors, um, later Zurich joined with Thomas Kappelo. And uh, so we had this, it was quite successful. It was, Dortmund was not, not a big, not as big a place as Bonn. So for my students, it was an extremely good opportunity to get uh, to, to see uh, ma worldwide mathematicians uh, and see them give presentations. It was a unique and great opportunity. Um, then at Bonn, I continued with that. Um, was I guess it was less important than for me because there were many people coming through Bonn. But still, it was nice to keep that up and to keep in contact with with people. Okay, and that then in 2020 the pandemic started, and Jean-Marc Delors was the key person to organize it. Then said, "Well, we have the video seminar, and the whole world copied us." Oh, you, yeah. that was you. <laughs> So you yeah. you uh, you set model uh, for these one world <laughs> seminars. You know, I'm, I'm wondering all of a sudden. So actually, that didn't happen in my research field, uh, but uh, I noticed some of my colleagues, um, uh, you know, suddenly advertising uh, the one world optimization seminar where everybody, um, uh, you know, came together and and shared uh, shared their mathematics during the pandemic. I see. Uh, so you got that started. That's nice. So actually, I would wow. like to hear the students' opinion on that too. Uh, what types of presentations uh, you you prefer? I, I guess uh, you know for you uh, the pandemic had a very different effect than uh, because it was somehow in the middle of your education. But first, let's hear a question from Dominic. Yeah. So um, my question is. Uh, in the graph in the beginning it's always splits in two right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, is there then a point from which it is not uh, explanation of two because uh, you said there are uh, all different types of as well lengths of orbits mm -hmm. and uh, what is the point where it is not a uh, power of two? So let me share the the iPad once more. I like your question. So, so uh, I, I, I have not been very specific because then this is much harder to understand. And it's, there's a sort of limit of, I see, so, there's first a period doubling, this cascade of period doubling. So we have one, two, four, or you can see that if I don't write. So we have one here, we have two, we have four, then you would have to enlarge it. And then we get a point where something new happens. And I don't know, I don't have a good understanding of what happens here. Maybe some people have. Uh, then you get to the point where, well, you get the white spots. So let's see what we see with the white spots. And let's try to do some counting. So here we seem to have a period six. Here we have, seem to have one, two, three, four, five, again a period six. And at this point we get a period three. And Tchaikovsky's theorem was if you have three, we get everything. If you have six, you get. Um, also 12, um, 24, and so on. So that we see here. Uh, but you, you I, mean, I gave you the information which I think which I understand. Um, I'm, I have to say, 
I'm fascinated by this chaos and I think it's a, I thought it's a good topic for uh, discussion, dis discussing it, but there are certainly people in the world which, who, who work professionally with it, more professional than me, I do, and they could say, um, say much more. Uh, but what I presented to you is the things which are possible to see and to understand, the period three, which gives all other periods. What you see here is, if you compare it with the period three, there might be something with period three in it, Probably not, but I would guess not, but maybe there is. But what you can see is that here the points are more evenly distributed. So, sorry, you can see this. If you look at this thing, then there's some darkness everywhere with some concentration, which seems that, which says that the points, the, the orbit stays more at points where things are thick, and otherwise it's thinner, but it distributes everywhere. So, um, it's it's not what I presented. It's not a complete understanding or explanation um, of this Feigenbaum diagram. Um, it, we did something rigorous. Let's say in the first part with a fixed point, with a periodic point, we could have extended that a bit further. Um, then I explained the heuristics about the Feigenbaum constant, which is related to this setting here. Um, and but but then things which I believe are not completely understood continue from there, which are still fascinating. Um, and then there are some points which are better understood, which is the three here. Um, but still, I mean, the, the, the picture is still fascinating. An indicative. Uh, we can, uh, uh, Dominic, maybe we can uh, ask Vadim Kaloshin, he's uh, also spending yep. a lot of time uh, with these diagrams and uh, let's see. Uh, how much he's thought about uh, period three. You might give a better answer than I do. <laughs> it was a good answer, Herbert. <laughs> uh, there, uh, let's see, there's another question in the chat. Uh, could e I'm reading it, but maybe you can also uh, ask it yourself. Uh, so, uh, um, Mito, can you help me pronounce the name, please? Yes, Volodymyr, please, please ask your question. You can raise your hand and ask the question. Okay, maybe I'm going to read it out. <laughs> uh, so, uh, good evening. I was very impressed by your presentation. Please tell me, would a two-dimensional example of the Navier-Stokes equations be suitable? Who? For military equations with random processes. Oh. So that's a oh. brave question, but then Volodymyr says, uh, I'm a bit shy. Yeah. Oh. What well, are the military equations? Uh, Volodymyr or Herbert? What do you mean I, by that? I don't know what, what you mean by that. Good evening. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. yeah um, <clears throat> uh, I asked this question because I know that uh, Gabriel Koch worked about uh, with Navier Stokes equations. And currently, I'm likewise working with uh, these equations, but um, currently, I'm writing a scientific paper with the uh, Lanchester equations in the warfare. And <clears throat> Uh, my research advisor asked me to use this equation, two-dimensional equations in it, and I asked how can I utilize this equation in my work? Will there be suitable for random process? Because uh, I wrote that I have deterministic character. Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't know what, what to answer. It's, I mean, there, there, I know that the people also looked at never stokes with uh, random noise with random forcing um but i'm not i'm certainly far away from from real applications um, of that and i mean that would have to be discussed in, in much more detail i don't think that it's possible to do it without knowing exactly what you want to know and what you want to do um, i can't give a generic answer to that uh, but for Dotomia, maybe if you um, uh, can send uh, me to, uh, uh, um, you know, a detail, uh, your, uh, your question with some more detailed, 
details we can um, uh, we can see and find the reference for you. Okay, thank you. Sure. Maybe I can return to your question with the teaching style. Uh, I mean, it was, uh -huh. I, I felt, uh, I really felt honored when I was invited to give the talk here this, because I, I mean, it's a small way to support what you're doing in, in Ukraine and Ukraine is certainly, is certainly much bigger need, much, makes, makes much more sense to have an online seminar like that. I'm not sure whether I would have accepted an invitation uh, to this in another country or another, another setting where, it, where I would be less convinced that it, there's a big point in doing that. Yeah, could you? Thank you, Herr Gerd. Um, but I, I guess it's a good learning experience for all of us. Uh, so I've never, um, I've ne I don't think I've ever attended a conference with such a diverse audience. Uh, there are students from all over the world participating, and of course, very many students from Ukraine. Um, okay. Uh, if there are no more questions, we could call it an evening, or for some of you, an early morning. <laughs> um, thank you. Okay. Then uh, thank you very much, Herbert, again, for your beautiful uh, lecture. And uh, uh, let me just see um, what um, the next presentation will be. Uh, so it will be on Sunday. Uh, and uh, Misha Skolnikov uh, is going to talk about shuffling cards. So Misha is uh, originally from Kharkiv. Uh, he moved uh, with his family to Germany when he was uh, uh, a young teenager, I believe. Uh, and he um, studied uh, in Munich uh, and then got his PhD at Stanford. Uh, that's where we met and uh, where we made friends. And he's uh, uh, an up-and-coming researcher in financial mathematics, uh, stochastic processes. So he's you know, very broadly interested. Uh, and uh, yeah, I really look forward to seeing you uh, for, for his presentation. I wish you all uh, a good rest of your day however long that may be. Uh, and thank you all very much again, Herbert. Thank you, and have a nice evening. Bye. Goodbye.